Okay. Well, welcome. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County, located in Glen Cove, New York. And I'm delighted you to welcome you this evening to our program that honors the anniversary of Nat Turner's Rebellion, which started on August 21st of 1831, 189 years ago today. Uh, you may wonder why the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center is holding a program that honors Nat Turner. And the answer is actually pretty straightforward. Uh, our mission is not only to teach about the history of the Holocaust, but also to teach about the dangers of anti-Semitism, racism, bullying, and all manifestations of intolerance. I'll add that I have a bit of a personal interest in this history as well. I have had the honor over the past several years of taking groups of adults and students to Germany and Poland on a number of occasions to study the history of the Holocaust at the sites where the Holocaust took place. And I often heard a pair of common reactions on those trips. On the one hand, participants were often impressed with the way Germans have confronted their past through memorials that highlight the atrocities that Germany committed and challenge their nation to face their own history. The other reaction, however, that I heard on many of my trips was from students and adults who recognize that Americans have not done nearly so much to confront the darkest parts of our country's history, particularly when it comes to the history of slavery and racism. Many on my trips came away from Germany believing that we in America need to do more to highlight the horrors of slavery and the long-term impact slavery had on our country. Their comments have moved me to think more about this. Earlier this year, in April, the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, along with thousands of other synagogues and historical museums across the country and even across the world, marked the anniversary of the largest Jewish uprising against the Nazis during World War II, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, with a commemorative program. And given our mission, along with recent events that have made it so clear that as a nation, we need to do more to face the racism and hate that has shaped our country, we decided to hold a program this year to mark the largest slave uprising in American history, Nat Turner's Rebellion. I'm gonna to talk today about both the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and Nat Turner's Rebellion. They are two events that are not often paired together. Uh, one largely is discussed only in Holocaust history classes or by Holocaust museums. The other largely is discussed only in African American history classes or African American history museums. And yet I think there are some interesting lessons to draw from looking at these events together. Let me explain to begin with some of the history of these two events. Nat Turner was born a slave into Southampton County, Virginia in 1800. He was one of more than 340,000 slaves in Virginia in 1800. That made up about 40% of the state's population. He was born at a time when it was a turning point in American slavery. 11 years earlier when the Constitution was ratified, many Americans believed slavery as an institution was coming to an end and would die out naturally. Slave imports into the new world were declining. Slave prices were falling because the crops grown by slaves, tobacco, rice, and indigo, did not generate the income needed to pay for the slaves' upkeep. Cotton, which we often associate as the cash crop of American slavery, was an insignificant blip on the agricultural map of the country in 1790, largely because of the laborious and time-consuming process of removing, removing the cotton seeds from the cotton fibers. You can see here that cotton was only a minor crop in America in, in 1790, grown only in a few small parts of South Carolina and Georgia. But in 1793, a young Massachusetts man named Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, which instantly made cotton production more financially viable. His simple engine could be used to separate the seeds from the threads easily and at a low cost. By the time Nat Turner was born seven years later, cotton production was rapidly expanding. And by 1830, a year before his rebellion, cotton accounted for a full 41% of the nation's export revenues. 
And with the growth of the cotton crop came a rebirth of American slavery. The two came hand in hand. The slave population of Southampton County, where Nat Turner lived, had risen to almost 8,000 by 1830, and slaves made up just under half of the total population of the county. Slavery was omnipresent and dominated Nat Turner's world. It was all he knew, yet he knew it was wrong. From what the sources we have say, Nat Turner did not have a particularly brutal master. Nat Turner later reported that Joseph Travis, his owner, quote, was to me a kind master and placed the greatest confidence in me. In fact, I had no cause to complain of his treatment to me. And from the available sources, it also appears that Nat Turner had a relatively stable childhood, later saying that both his parents influenced his youth and that he knew at least one of his grandfathers. But as with all black families in the antebellum South, slavery ripped apart Nat Turner's family. To say that he had a relatively stable childhood is to admit that he probably did not live with his parents for anything but a short time, and that even when he did, care and uh, their care and authority was always limited by the decisions made by their white slave owners. Regardless of whether Nat Turner felt his owner was kind or whether he was able to maintain any relationship with his family members, Nat Turner was treated as a piece of property to be used treated, sold, and controlled as his white owner wanted. He was whipped when he showed any resistance and was only provided the food and comfort that was issued to animals. He found salvation through religion and by 1831 was preaching the Bible to his fellow slaves, some of whom referred to him as the prophet. When Nat Turner and his fellow slaves witnessed a solar eclipse on February 12th, 1831, Turner believed it was a sign from God that he should lead a slave rebellion, that the dark hand of African-American slaves would overwhelm their white owners. He gathered four other slaves together the following day and told them of the meaning of the eclipse. They agreed that they would work together for a slave uprising, but they kept the plan a secret from anybody else, aware that any leakage of information about such a plan was sure to lead to disaster. The group originally planned their rebellion to start on July 4th, when even slaves knew the Declaration of Independence had been signed with the famous line, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But Turner felt ill on July 4th, and so the uprising was delayed. Finally, on August 21st, 1831, the four conspirators, along with three other slaves, gathered and launched the uprising. It was a surprisingly small group, but Nat Turner knew his religious interpretation of the clips would not spur many slaves to join him. Instead, his plan was for the revolt to grow by attracting slaves as they went. The group began at the Travis farm, Turner's owners, and then went from house to house freeing slaves and killing all the white people who they encountered, men, women, and children. The revolt spread on Monday, eventually gathering a group of 70 slaves and killing approximately 60 whites. But on Tuesday, the rebels confronted a significantly larger white militia who stopped the insurrection. The retribution was savage. Historian Patrick Breen, who's written the most exhaustive study on the rebellion, writes, there were few moments in American history when the balance between protecting the innocent and punishing the guilty had been as far skewed to vengeance as it was in Southampton, especially in the immediate aftermath of the revolt. Inspired by the murders that the rebels committed, many whites wanted revenge, even if that meant killing innocent blacks. The exact number of slaves killed in the aftermath of the rebellion is hard to assess, given conflicting accounts. Nat Turner and 29 others were rounded up and found guilty by white courts for their involvement in the revolt. 18 of them were hanged and 12 were sold out of state. Nat Turner was hanged. But the more savage response came before the trials when somewhere between 40 and 120 other slaves were killed outside the judicial process 
in brutal ways that were meant to send a number of messages. First, they were meant to warn the black community of the response that could be expected if anyone followed in Nat Turner's footsteps. Second, they sought to show the extent of white domination and to make clear that the revolt had failed. And third, they were meant to demonstrate to blacks and whites that slavery and racial hierarchy were secure in Southampton County. Nat Turner's rebellion also sparked a far larger impact. In the wake of the revolt, the state of Virginia made it illegal to teach reading and writing to slaves or to free blacks or to mulattoes. They also restricted all blacks from holding religious meetings without the presence of a licensed white minister. And they criminalized the possession of abolition publications, whether written by whites or blacks. And other slaveholding states in the South followed suit enacting similar laws restricting activities and, for slaves and free blacks. While there were hundreds of other slave uprisings in the United States before the Civil War, these new laws and the harsh restrictions they imposed helped to prevent any of those other slave uprisings from spreading into something larger. I want to say a few more words about Nat Turner's rebellion, but before I get to those, let me change gears for a few minutes and talk about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, a revolt that took place in a very different circumstance more than 110 years later. On September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland and began to concentrate the three million Polish Jews into densely crowded ghettos located in cities across the country. The largest of these was at the Warsaw Ghetto, where over 400,000 people were packed behind newly erected stone walls in a 3.3 square kilometer area within central Warsaw. Here you see an outline of the ghetto area and the type of wall that was built to separate the Jews inside the ghetto from the rest of the Polish population. In 1939, the plan was to concentrate the Jews in these ghettos and then expel them from the country. But in late 1942, the Nazis came up with a new plan, a plan to murder all the Jews of Europe. And they began deporting the Jews in ghettos to new killing centers or death camps. Deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto started in July of 1942, mostly going to the killing center at Treblinka. As word leaked back into the ghetto that the deported were being murdered rather than resettled, various groups in the ghetto created underground organizations and armed self-defense units. But internal division, uncertainty about, uncertainty about Nazi plans and Nazi informants prevented these groups from coming together and uniting against the Germans. As the deportations continued, underground leaders were often targeted by the Nazis, further undermining any successful revolt. By September of 1942, when the deportations came to a halt, the German authorities had sent some 300,000 Jews to their death, leaving only about 35,000 official residents in the ghetto, along with another 20,000 or so who were hiding. For these remaining Jews, these 55,000, deportation and death seemed inevitable. When the deportation resumed in January of 1943, a group of Jewish fighters were ready and attacked the Nazi guards as they forced a group of Jews out to transfer points from the ghetto. Most of the Jewish fighters were killed in the battle, but they enabled many of those who were supposed to be deported to escape. The Nazis then suspended further deportations. Encouraged by their apparent success, which they believe had halted the deportation, members of the ghetto underground began to plan for a larger fight when the Germans attempted to empty the ghetto, which they expected would come soon. That fight came on April 19, 1943, on the eve of Passover that year. When the SS and police entered the ghetto to begin rounding up the Jews, the streets were deserted. Then on a signal, Jewish fighters, armed with what few weapons they had been able to procure, along with homemade hand grenades, launched their uprising, forcing the German troops to retreat out of the ghetto. The Nazis, of course, returned with greater strength, but continued to face armed resistance. Though the German forces broke the organized military resistance within days of the beginning of the uprising, individuals and small groups 
hid or fought the Germans for almost a month. You can see here pictures of the Nazis capturing some of the ghetto fighters. The pictures were taken for the German general, Scoop, to send back to his superiors in Berlin to show his effectiveness. But they also show that those holding out included men, women, and children. Eventually, the Germans resorted to systematically burning houses block by block using flamethrowers and fire bottles and blowing up basements and sewers to leave no hiding places available for the Jews. Finally, after almost a month of fighting, the German general claimed victory on May 16, 1943. The general reported that he had captured 56,000 Jews and destroyed 631 bunkers. He estimated that his units had killed another 7,000 Jews during the uprising, and the German authorities reported approximately 7,000 more Warsaw Jews were sent to Treblinka, the killing center, where almost all were killed in the gas chambers upon arrival. The remaining Jews, some 42,000, were largely sent to the Madanik concentration camp, where, with the exception of a very small number, they were murdered in the Nazi Operation Harvest Festival in November, the largest single massacre of Jews by German forces during the Holocaust. The Nazis' systematic destruction of the buildings in the ghetto left the area and the city in ruins. Here's an aerial photograph showing the destruction of the ghetto, the northern part of the ghetto. It may be a little hard to see from this top-down view, but I think you get a sense the area was essentially razed. This is a ground-level view that also shows the destruction. Both of these revolts, the Nat Turner's Rebellion and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, were launched despite almost impossible odds. There was really only one successful example of a slave rebellion in the Americas that Nat Turner might have heard of, and that was the Haitian Revolution of 1791 against the French that had ended slavery in Saint-Domingue. But Nat Turner knew that he had a very different situation. In 1791, in Saint-Domingue, the slaves outnumbered the whites on a, by a ratio of 10 to 1. And the French were seeking to, um, to rule the nation or rule that colony from thousands of miles away. Even if Nat Turner didn't imagine a complete overturning of white rule as his goal in 1831, he had to know that the chance he would die during the rebellion or be killed afterwards was almost certain. Similarly, those in the Warsaw Ghetto knew their efforts were not likely to defeat the Nazi military force that surrounded them. Even if they'd been able to acquire weapons for everyone in the ghetto, which they were not, their numbers were dwarfed by the surrounding army. Those odds may not have dissuaded Nat Turner or the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto from launching their attacks, but in both cases, the odds did have an effect. Nat Turner found resistance from other slaves as his revolt spread to neighboring plantations. He'd expect, he had expected slaves would flock to his call, but instead, he found many that ran from him, fearing the failure of his rebellion and the retribution that would follow. And in the Warsaw Ghetto, it took months of deportations to get agreement about the need to unite against the Germans and to respond with physical force. Somewhat counterintuitively, the impossible odds actually served to spur on the leaders of both these uprisings. If Nat Turner had seen some positive future in his enslavement, he probably would not have risked his life in the uprising. Those that joined him also largely fought because they were willing to lose their lives rather than continue living under the conditions that faced them on a daily basis. And in the Warsaw Ghetto, the eventual recognition that the Nazis planned to kill every single person in the ghetto is what helped spur some of the residents to say that if they were going to die, then they should at least try and take down some of the Nazis with them. In the case of Nat Turner, there is some evidence to believe that Nat Turner actually thought that his uprising might change the minds of white slave owners about the immorality of what they were doing. But as one historian has written, Turner believed that only a cataclysmic act could convince the architects of a violent social order that violence begets violence. 
we know of the countless smaller efforts made by enslaved people to try and undermine the slaveholding society. Things like breaking tools or doing work slowly or running away, which Nat Turner himself tried a few years before the rebellion. No, none of those convinced slaveholders that owning other human beings was wrong. But Nat, Her Nat Turner hoped that a violent revolt might make the slaveholders reassess their understanding. Somewhat surprisingly, in the wake of Turner's rebellion, there were actually calls in the Virginia legislature to pass a gradual emancipation law, which would have ended slavery in the state and the threat of any slave uprising. But as I said, the legislature decided to go the other direction. And instead of moving toward ending slavery, they passed laws that strengthened the restrictions on both free blacks and the enslaved. In the Warsaw Ghetto, there is much less evidence to believe those fighting against the Germans thought they had a chance of convincing Nazi Germany to leave Warsaw and focus their energies elsewhere. Their uprising seems more clearly a last ditch effort after they had realized that death was inevitable. Let me make one final point about these two uprising. I want to point out that they have both been used to contradict a common claim often made about the slaves of the antebellum South and the Jews in Nazi occupied Europe. The claim is that both of these groups were passive victims of their oppressors. Slaveholders long claimed this position, using it to argue that slavery was not actually that bad in America. They claimed that slave owners held a paternalistic role for their slaves, treating them not only well, but actually better than factory owners in the free North treated workers. One repeated claim was that the lack of slave rebellions in America, in the antebellum South, was a sign that the slaves were actually happy in their condition. But it was not just slave owners who pushed this view. Southern historians after the collapse of Reconstruction in the 1870s and 1880s also embraced this view. James Schuler, one of the leading historians in 1882 claimed slaves had an innate patience, docility, and childlike simplicity. Those words might have some positive connotations. He also wrote that slaves were from, quote, a black servile race, sensuous, stupid, brutish, obedient to the whip, and children in imagination. Henry Louis Gates, one of the leading historians of recent years, wrote in response to this, consider how bizarre this was. It wasn't enough that slaves had been subjugated under a harsh and brutal regime for two and a half centuries. Following the collapse of Reconstruction, this school of historians, unapologetically supportive of slavery, kicked the slaves again for not rising up more frequently to kill their oppressing masters. The Nat Turner Rebellion, of course, undercuts the position. And abolitionists, even in the immediate wake of the rebellion, highlighted it as a way to point out the fallacy of slaveholder claims about the good condition that slaves were living in. In the last 50 years, historians have dug up details of hundreds of other rebellions and raised the many other ways that slaves fought back, again, highlighting that the slave owner's argument about the, the good condition slaves lived under completely false. A somewhat similar image, though, can be found about Jews during the Holocaust. The seeming passivity of Jews who were marched in orderly lines to rail cars and then into the gas chambers, like here on the ramp at Auschwitz, created the sense after the war that Jews accepted their death without opposition. I've heard from several survivors who lived in Israel after the war that they never spoke about their experiences because Sabras, native-born Jews in Israel, who did not experience the Holocaust, were critical of European Jews for allowing the Holocaust to happen. This was not a view that was unique to the Sabras. It was a common view held by people in countries all across the world. In antebellum America, restricting teaching about how to read or write and cutting off communication helped to isolate slaves and prevent them from rebelling. That kind of control and restriction wasn't possible in the 1940s, but there was one other factor that worked to undermine Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, hope. Jews held on to the idea that by being compliant and following Nazi orders, that would enable them to survive to the end of the war. 
in ghettos all across Europe, Jews thought that if they were productive and useful to the Nazis, they would be saved. And there was always the sense that they just had to hold out a bit longer until Hitler was overthrown or the Allies came to their aid. The Nazis, of course, encouraged that sense of hope in order to keep the Jews obedient and orderly. They intentionally deceived the Jews, leaving them to believe that the relocation and separation of their families were only temporary and that they were vital, valued workers for the German war effort. But while the Nazis were masterminding ways to, de to deceive the Jews and to give them hope, they were also planning and executing their mass murder. I don't need to go into the ways that the Nazis undermined resistance through brutality or the fact that very few Jews or observers from other countries grasped even in the, eight, in the 1940s the previously incomprehensible plan by the Nazis to murder millions of Jews. But despite the brutal opposition and repression and the inconceivable situation, there were still uprisings not only in Warsaw, but in dozens of other ghettos and concentration camps. This map was produced by the historian Yehuda Bauer to show where some of the biggest revolts took place. And as with slaves in antebellum America, the Jews found countless other ways to resist, including sustaining their religious beliefs, stealing food or buying it through the black market, running secret schools, and keeping records of what was taking place, among other things. Still, with this false image of the passive Jew in mind, when it came for Israel to choose a day to commemorate the Holocaust, they chose Yom HaShoah to be held every year on the anniversary of the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. The date was chosen to highlight the fallacy of the argument. The fact is that Jews fought back in the 1940s, as did slaves in the antebellum South. They fought back regardless of the odds, and regardless of the repercussions. And that itself should be a sign of how desperate the situation was for both these groups in their respective eras. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. I didn't wanna take a long time in your Friday evening, but thank you for listening to the program. I wanted to uh, invite you to post any questions in the Q&A feature. And while you're doing that, let me remind you of some of our other upcoming programs. Next Tuesday at 6 p.m., we're offering, offering one of our regular virtual gallery tours. Join me and our Director of Education, Helen Turner, for a collaborative tour through our gallery. Even though our building is closed, these tours give you a chance to see the exhibition. Then next Wednesday, on August 27th at 2 p.m., I will be holding the next edition of my weekly Curator's Corner, this time focusing on a silver-plated creamer that was used by a hotel in Nuremberg and decorated with a swastika to show their support for National Socialism. It's a small object, but the hotel was prominently included in Lenny Riefenstahl's famous film, Triumph of the Will. I think you'll find it interesting. And then next Thursday, let me draw your attention to our evening program next Thursday at six o'clock, where we're gonna be celebrating the anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment 100 years ago this August. Antonia Petrash will give a talk based on her book about the suffrage movement on Long Island. To learn more about our programs, either these and the rest of our programs, take a look on our website at www.hmtcli.org and click on the events tab. And please, when you go there, also click on the Give Now tab and make a donation. Okay, if you have any questions, feel free to, to type them in the Q&A feature. Otherwise, uh, I wish you a good evening. I see we've got one question here. Any information regarding the number of people who were able to escape from Warsaw as a result of the uprising? You know, the, there's not a whole lot of information about the number who were able to get away. Some escaped uh, under the walls or through gaps to the home army, but it was a relatively small number. Most of the Jews who were still in the ghetto in um, in 1943, they either fought and a few survived or they were killed. Was there a leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising? You know, there were a number of leaders actually. Um, there was a guy named Pavel Frankel, who recently there's a book that came out about his involvement. 
as being a leader. I think, let me just see here, I had the note here. Uh, Flags on the Warsaw Ghetto, I think is the name of the book uh, that mentions how important he was. Otherwise, I know Arie Vilner was one of the leaders, uh, Mordecai and Kavitz. Um, there were a number of people. In fact, one of the amazing things was finally there, was, there were a number of different groups and they were able to come together uh, in the end. Uh, sadly, they didn't come together earlier, but so there were a number of leaders. Um, okay, well, thanks very much. And I look forward to seeing you at other programs that we run in the future. Have a fine evening and a nice weekend. Bye-bye.